Hi, guys. So we have Hala um, and Ahmed, right? Sorry about that, guys. I was running a bit late. Um, how's everyone doing? All right, guys, let's get started. So, hello, we have a new student in our class. Um, welcome. Um, so, how was everybody's uh, break? Was it good? Okay. Awesome. All right. So, hello. Tell me where you have left off. I did give you some, um, a little bit of uh, homework, asking you to go ahead and start the other lessons. Uh, go ahead and tell me where did you leave off? Uh, I actually think we left off at around lesson five. Five? Okay. I've yep, already started a bit of lesson six, so yeah. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and start lesson five. Hello everyone and welcome to unit one lesson five. Today we're talking about acid base equilibrium. So let's get started. As always, here's your curriculum expectations. So analyze the optimal conditions for a specific chemical process related to the principles of equilibrium, terminology related to chemical systems of equilibrium, and solve problems related to equilibrium. Yes, you're not sharing your screen. And then point two, oh, okay. equilibrium constants and right solutions. Thanks, Hella. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Unit 1, Lesson 5. Today, we're talking about acid-base equilibrium. So let's get started. OK, can everybody see this? Um, yes. Ahmed, are you able to see it? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, great.
As always, here's your curriculum expectations. So analyze the optimal conditions for a specific chemical process related to the principles of equilibrium. Um, use appropriate terminology related to chemical systems of equilibrium and solve problems related to equilibrium by performing calculations. And then 3.2, identify common equilibrium constants and write their expressions. More importantly, your learning goals and success criteria. Students will explain the Bronsted-Lowry theory of acids and bases and use the ion product constant of water or KW. And your success criteria, you'll do this by finding the conjugated acid-base pair and by calculating pH, uh, pOH, H3O plus, and OH minus, uh, the concentration of those for chemical reaction. So acids and bases, you should be pretty familiar with what acids and bases are. You started learning about that in grade 10. And they are electrolytes that form aqueous solutions, um, and they have unique properties. Right, acid, acidic solutions, remember, like vinegar are sour tasting, they conduct electricity, whereas basic solutions um, also conduct electricity, but are generally bitter tasting and feel slippery. And we can, we can characterize acids and bases in terms of chemical properties as, as well. Acids are solutes that produce hydrogen ions, H plus ions. And aqueous solutions, while well, bases produce hydroxide ions or OH minus ions um, when dissolved in water. So acids have um, properties, right, due to that H plus ion, they turn litmus paper red if you were doing a pH test. And bases have the properties due to the presence of the OH minus hydroxide ion, and they turn that litmus paper blue if you were doing like in a lab, an acid and base test. So these first classifications of or character characterizations of acids and bases was done by an individual called Arrhenius, which is why we call it the Arrhenius theory of acids and bases. Right? The model or adequately explains the properties of most acids and hydroxide bases, but it has some limitations and it fails to properly account for basic properties of compounds that don't have the hydroxide ion. For example, ammonia, NH3, ammonia is a base, but doesn't have a hydroxide ion. So this Arrhenius theory is not fully, um, fully comprehensive. Instead, we have a, a Bronsted-Lowry theory, which we're gonna talk about um, instead. So H plus is a, a bare proton does not exist in water. It is attracted to a lone pair of electrons on oxygen and water forming a hydronium ion, H3O plus. Right. And again, like I said, um, it fails to explain why ammonia, example, a base that doesn't have a hy that hydroxide ion, um, is still basic. Right. And as well, some reactions take place without any liquid involved. That's just the one right there. So it's not always, we don't characterize acids and bases always as just an aqueous um, dissolving in water or aqueous solutions. So the Arrhenius theory, again, states that acids generate H plus ions in water and bases generate hydroxide ions in water. But the Bronsted-Lowry theory is just in terms of protons. So for example, when hydrogen chloride reacts with water, a proton is transferred from a hydrogen chloride molecule to a water molecule, forming a hydronium ion, that H3O plus, and a chloride ion. Right, so hydrogen chloride acts as a Bronsted-Lowry acid, whereas water, the one accepting, accepting the H+, acts as a Bronsted-Lowry base. All right, so according to the Bronsted-Lowry theory, acids are H plus donors and bases are H plus acceptors. So the Bronsted-Lowry theory recognizes that an acid-base reaction um, as a chemical equilibrium. So it has both the forward reaction and the reverse reaction involving the transfer of that proton. Right? An acid is a substance from which a proton can be removed or a proton donor, and a base is a substance that can accept a proton. 
right? And that proton um, is referring to the nucleus of the hydrogen atom, that H plus we call a proton. So in a proton transfer reaction at equilibrium, when we're looking at the Bronsted-Lowry theory, both forward and reverse reactions involve Bronsted-Lowry acids and bases. So for example, in this hydrochloric acid solution, the forward reaction is a proton transfer from the hydrochloric acid to the water, to water molecules. And the reverse reaction is a proton transfer from the, the um, hydronium ion to the, the Cl minus, or sorry, to the H3O plus. So this equilibrium is typical of all bronsted lowry acid base reactions. There's always going to be two acids and two bases in any acid-base equilibrium. We call this a conjugate acid-base pair. And we'll talk a bit more about that. So in our bronsted lowry definition, here's our, our reaction. We have HCl plus NH3 yields Cl minus and then NH4 plus. The acids donate protons. So we know the, the hydrogen from HCl is being donated to the ammonia. The base accepts the protons. So our HCl is the acid and our NH4 or NH3 is the base. And like I said, a, this is called a conjugate acid-base pair. We have a pair of substances whose molecular formulas differ by a single H plus ion or a proton. It's called a conjugate acid-base pair. So two substances in an aqueous solution whose formulas differ by an H plus. The acid is the more positive species having the extra H plus, right? Because acids accept the acids accept, or sorry, donate, um, are the ones that have the extra H plus and donate the H plus to the base. So we have our, in our reaction here, we have our acid HCl plus our base NH3. And then the conjugate base is our Cl minus, right? The one that um, gave up the H plus and our conjugate acid is the one that then gained the proton. Looking at another example, an acetic acid molecule and an acetate ion are a conjugate acid-base pair. Acetic acid is the conjugate acid of the acetate ion, and the acetate ion is the conjugate base of acetic acid, right? And then the hydronium ion in water is the second conjugate acid-base pair in this equilibrium. And here's another example looking at ammonia NH3 plus H2O. NH3 is our base, H2O is our acid. And then the conjugate pair, so of, of ammonia or NH3 is the base. It is paired with the conjugate acid, which becomes the NH4 plus, right? It gained a proton it's a con from, but it was a base, so it's the conjugate acid. And then the initial acid, which was the water, which we know is the one that's going to give up that H plus, its conjugate pair is a conjugate base, which then becomes OH minus. And this, this theory um, can help explain examples that the Arrhenius theory, the original theory cannot. So we use the conjugate acid base pair, um, bronsted lowry theory. And here's the table showing conjugate pairs and acid different or common acid base reactions. So there's six different reactions listed here and they just help you identify which one is the acid. So the acid is listed first in all of those reactions followed by the base. And then you have the, the conjugate base and then the conjugate acid. It's showing you 
um, the, the red is our is our one conjugate, or red is the acid, blue are the bases. So then one red goes with one blue, right? The acid is conjugate pair with its conjugate base. And then the initial base on our reactant side of the reaction is conjugate pair with the, the product that ends up as the acid. So another way to look at it is that the conjugate base um, remains after the, it's what remains after the H plus is lost. So if our acid is HCl, the conjugate base is Cl minus. And then our conjugate acid is what remains after the H plus is gained. So if our base in our reactants is NH3, the conjugate acid of that is NH4 plus. You also have amphoteric substances, and those are substances that can act as either an acid or a base. So water acts as an acid in the presence of a stronger base, but it can also act as a base if it's in the presence of a stronger acid, right? It can become OH minus or it can become H3O plus. So it is amphoteric, it can be an acid or a base. The autoionization of water is the dissociation of an acidic or basic compound in aqueous solution, um, producing ions that interact with water. So the pH of an aqueous solution is determined by the position of equilibrium in reactions between the ions that are present and the water molecules. So water is never just a collection of of pure H2O molecules, right? Experiments have revealed that some water molecules react with each other to produce hydronium ions or H3O plus and hydroxide ions or OH minus, according to this equation here. And because the conductivity um, is so slight, there must be considerably more water molecules than ions in an equilibrium mixture of this reaction at standard um, atmospheric temperature and pressure. So in every sample of water, an equilibrium is formed between the hydronium ions, the hydroxide ions, and water molecules, but it greatly favors the water molecules. And of the billions of random collisions occurring amongst water molecules, a few are at the right energy and orientation to cause a reaction. So this results in the transfer of a proton, H+, from one molecule of water to the other, producing a hydronium ion and a hydroxide ion. Right? So these collisions, um, which form these ions, is very rare in water, but it does happen. And this is called the auto-ionization of water. So by definition, that auto-ionization of water is a reaction between two water molecules producing a hydronium ion and a hydroxide ion. And here's that reaction here, showing the collision that forms hydronium and hydroxide ions. And again, remember, this is really rare in a sample of water, but does happen. We can also create a equilibrium constant for this called the ion product constant of water, or Kw. To recall our equation, right, we have the two water molecules colliding together. One acts as an acid, one acts as a base, creating our hydronium and hydroxide ions. So one water molecule, water molecule acts as the acid, the other as a base, and the equilibrium constant for this reaction is called Kw. And the value of Kw is 1.0 times 10 to the power of negative 14, and our equation for that is the concentration of hydronium ion times the concentration of our hydroxide ion.
So recall again, water is amphoteric. It can either be an acid or a base. And that is shown very well in this ion product constant for water equation. Where you have an acid and a base, one, and they're both water molecules, yielding H3O plus and OH minus. And our, our KW, your ion product constant for water, is this formula, so something to keep in mind, and it's equal to one times 10 to the power of negative 14 at 25 degrees Celsius. So again, we can calculate the hydrogen and hydroxide ion concentrations using our KW and using this formula. Remembering that in pure water, the concentrations of the hydroxide and um, hydrogen ions are equal, right? It's a one-to-one -one ratio in our equation. So the concentration of our H3O plus is going to be equal to the concentration of our OH minus, which is 1.0 times 10 to the negative seven moles. This is just a figure showing how of all the water molecules together and those intermolecular forces of attraction between separate water molecules, sometimes you have a collision and you get that proton transfer from one, high, um, from one water molecule to another, forming the hydroxide ion and the hydronium ion. And we can use the ion product constant for water, KW, to calculate either the hydrogen ion concentration or the hydroxide ion concentration in an aqueous solution of a strong or weak acid or base at standard atmospheric temperature and pressure um, if the other concentration is known. Right? So since our KW is equal to the concentration of H3, H3O plus times the concentration of OH minus, we can then um, rearrange our formulas to get that the concentration of H3O plus is equal to the KW over the concentration of OH minus and vice versa for the concentration of OH minus. So for example, calculate the hydroxide ion concentration of a solution in which the hydrogen ion concentration is 3.6 times 10 to the power of negative three. So we write out our formula, KW equals the concentration of H3O plus times the concentration of OH minus, which we know is equal to 1.0 times 10 to the power of negative 14. We are given our concentration of, of our H3O plus is 3.6 times 10 to the negative 3. We rearrange our formula, do the math, and we get the concentration of OH minus to be 2.8 times 10 to the negative 12. Here's a table showing some common uses of acids and bases. And they're like in our households, right? We use acids and bases every day. So for example, acetic acid is vinegar um, used for flavoring and also for preserving food. Um, boric acid is a mild antiseptic and incest insecticide. And hydrochloric acid is used in brick and ceramic tile cleaner. In contrast, our bases like sodium hydroxide is used in our oven cleaning or plumbing. Ammonia is a common household cleaner. And trisodium phosphate is a cleaner for surfaces before painting or wallpapering. Sodium hydrogen carbonate is used in fire extinguishers. It's also a rising um, agent in cake mixes like baking soda. Moving on to talk about pH and pOH. So pH is the exponential power of hydrogen or hydronium ions in moles per liter. And then pOH is the exponential power of hydroxide ions in a solution. Right, the pH of a solution is the negative of the logarithm to the base 10 of the hydrogen ion concentration. So 
pH equals negative log times the concentration of H3O plus. And then pOH is the negative log of the concentration of OH minus. And together, pH plus pOH will always equal to 14. And we get that 14 because our pKW, um, which we can say is equal to the negative log times the concentration of kW, which we know is 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14. When we take the negative or inverse log of that, we get 14. So our pOH is equal to our, our plus our pH is equal to 14. <laughs> We can use these mathematical formulas to calculate pH, pOH, and the concentrations. Um, let's look at an example. Water taken from a lake was found to have a concentration of H plus of 3.2 times 10 to the negative 5. Calculate the pH and pOH. Well, our concentration for pH is negative log um, times the concentration of H plus, which we know 3.2 times 10 to the negative 5. So we get our pH of 4.49. We can then easily calculate pOH because we know that the pH plus pOH has to equal 14. So if we minus our 4.49 by 14, we get a pOH of what's left over at 9.51. With another example, what is the pH of a 0.0026 molar NaOH solution? Well, our pOH is negative log times the concentration of OH minus, which we are given in the question. So we sub that in, do the negative log of that, and we get a pOH of 2.59. To calculate the pH, that is 14 minus 2.59, and we get 11.41. And here is a chart showing the concentration of H3O plus and OH minus, and then the pH and pOH of different, um, uh, different concentrations of acids and bases. So you can refer to this chart to get, um, if you have a given concentration of either of those things, what the pH and pOH will be um, for different acids and bases. And again, just quantifying pH a little bit. So remembering that pH is a scale from 0 to 14, right? 14 being most basic, 0 being more acidic. And where some different things fall along that scale. 7 is neutral. Milk is slightly acidic. Um, sodium hydroxide is super basic. Stomach acid is super acidic. Lemon juice, acidic. Vinegar, so on and so forth. And there's a couple different ways we can measure pH. You can use an actual electronic measurement tool, which you dip into the solution, or you can use that litmus paper, which you might have used in a lab before. It's a little strip of paper, and it turns blue or red, depending on if it is an acid or a base. So moving on with another example, calculating hydrogen ion concentration from pH. So the pH reading of a solution is 10.33. What is the hydrogen ion concentration? Well, we know we have our, our equation, which is pH equals negative log concentration of H plus. To get the concentration of H plus, we need to get rid of log. By doing that, you go base 10 to the power of negative pH. That's how we rearrange the equation to solve for the concentration. So we get 10 to the negative 10.33, when you do that in your calculator, you get a concentration of H plus of 4.7 times 10 to the power of negative 11. So it works both ways, these formulas for calculating the concentration of something or the pH. Looking at these different strengths of acids and bases now. So a strong acid completely transfers its protons to water, leaving no undissociated molecules in water. In contrast, a weak acid 
only partially dissociates in water, right? So it exists as a mixture of acid molecules and their constituent ions. And again, remember the conjugate base of a weak acid is a weak base. So to quantify that, a, a strong acid is an acid that ionizes quantitatively or completely in water to form hydrogen ions. Right, so the percent ionization of a strong acid is like greater than 99%, but we, we assume when we do our calculations, it's 100% dissociated. So for example, um, for a strong acid, we will assume that every molecule of hydrogen chloride, HCl, for example, um, that dissolves in water ionizes to its ions H plus and Cl minus, 100%. So an example of a strong acid is HCl, a weak acid is CH3COOH or acetic acid. A strong base is sodium hydroxide, NaOH. And then a weak base is ammonia. So notice how for the strong acids and strong bases, we have only one, the reaction's only going in one direction. So the HCl is 100% or 100% of those HCl molecules are dissociating into H plus and Cl minus ions. So the reaction doesn't go both ways. Whereas a weak acid or a weak base, right, you'll have some um, acid molecules or base molecules, some ammonia and some acetic acid, and then some of the constituent ions in the solution as well. So strong acids have 100% dissociation, a good H plus donor, and that equilibrium lies far to the right, and it generates a weak base. In contrast, a strong or a weak acid is less than 100% dissociation. It's not as a as good of an H plus donor. The equilibrium lies far to the left, but it generates a strong base. Here's a figure again showing the dissociation of strong versus weak acids, right? So in this top example, a strong acid before dissociation and after dissociation, you don't have any of that, you know, hypothetical HA acid anymore. That, that strong acid is completely dissociated into its ions. In contrast, a weak acid, not a lot of dissociation happening there. So some more examples, calculating the pH of a strong acid. Calculate the pH of a 0 0.050 molar HCl solution. Since HCl is a strong acid, we're going to assume it dissociates completely 100%, right? So the concentration of H3O plus is equal to uh, 0 0.050 molar, right, a one to one. And we use our formula, pH equals negative log concentration of H3O plus negative log concentration of plug that value in 0 0.050 and we get a pH of 1.3. Let's look at another example of calculating the pH of a strong base. So calculate the pH of a 0 0.017 molar barium hydroxide solution. Barium hydroxide is a strong base. So we know it's going to completely dissociate into Ba2 plus, plus 2 OH minus. We write out our, our um, chemical reaction for that, our balanced chemical reaction. So the concentration of OH minus is 2 times the concentration of our barium hydroxide based on our molar ratios, which is 0 0.034. We plug that into our pOH equation or formula. <laughs> Sorry, that is my dog's his toy in the background. And we get a pOH of 1.47 minus that by 14, we get a pH of 12.53. All right, that is the end of this lesson. Have a great day and I'll see you next time. Okay. Now guys, <clears throat> there is an activity associated with this. Um, 
So go ahead and work on this activity and as well as the multiple choice quiz. Okay. Hello, everyone. So welcome to after um, each video, there's usually an activity, and this is uh, for you, Ahmad. Are you are you there? Um, can you please open your uh, un Can you please unmute and open your video for me, just so that I know you guys are there. Oh, Ahmad, I think you don't have audio. Is that right? Okay. Okay, so go ahead and work on this activity. And we will go ahead and Okay, um, let me check something for you, Hella. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, let's see.
Okay. Um, so, um, Ahmad, I wanted to make sure that you have access to all of these lessons. Are you there? Okay. So, um, Ahmad, I want you to go ahead and go over everything, you know, and then try to catch up because we are on lesson number six at the moment. And so like I said, after each lesson, After each video lesson, let's say for this one, there is an activity down here that you'll click on. You click on activity, and then there's going to be a multiple choice quiz, okay? So go ahead and work on those for each of these lessons after you've seen the video and studied the lesson. Okay, we're gonna go on to um, lesson seven. Hello everyone and welcome to Unit 1 Lesson 7. We're going to be talking about acid-based titrations today. So our learning goals and success criteria for this lesson. Students will solve problems related to acid-based equilibrium. Students will use appropriate terminology related to chemical systems and equilibrium endpoint, equivalence point, and titrant. And success criteria, um, you could, you'll do this by using acid-based titration data and the pH and equivalence point. Also listed here are your curriculum expectations. So in your previous chemistry course, you become you were a little bit familiarized with acid-base titration. So a titration is a chemical analysis involving the progressive addition of a solution of a known solute concentration called the titrant into a solution of unknown concentration called the sample. And the purpose of a titration is to determine the amount of the specified chemical in the sample um, from which the molar mass and the concentration of the chemical may be determined. And this is possible because the titrant and the sample contain substances that react according to known stoichiometry. So in general, you have a sample which is placed in a receiving flask and the titrant is dispensed from a sort of a long um, piece of glassware called a burette. All right, guys, so over here you see a burette, this glass vial down here, and it has like a stopper at the end. So, and then here's your beaker, right? So they drop 
like bit by bit, what happens is the water drop or the the concentration here, it um, the NOH liquid, it they just drop it in the HCl concentration here, like drop by drop. Okay. So here's a closer look at your titration equipment. You have the concentration of an acid or base solution of unknown concentration, and we, we determine it, we determine that concentration by the delivery from a burette of a measured volume of a solution of known concentration called the titrant. And if the sample in the flask is an acid, then the titrant used is a base and vice versa. So here we have our pipette. You have your stand holding everything up um, attached to your burette, which has your base solution in here. And then in your um, Erlenmeyer flask or volumetric flask, sorry, you have a your acid in it. It's sitting on a white piece of paper, and you also have a measuring cylinder. And this is your measuring cylinder right here. This is your flask and then your burette and your pipette. These are the instrumentations. The burette contains the, um, the basic solution and then the flask contains the acidic solution, usually. So like I said, there are ultimately two reasons to run a titration, to determine the concentration of an unknown reactant or to determine the equilibrium constant for the reaction. And our pH is equal to our pKa at half of the equivalence point. And this is what we call the buffer region. Talked a little bit about this in the last lesson, but there are certain um, indicators that you use in a titration called the acid base indicator. And they are weak acids, acids which undergo a color change at a known pH. And they have a different color than their conjugate base form. So this example of an acid base indicator is phenolphthalein. So it is it is no color, it's colorless at a pH two, four, five, and seven. But as soon as you reach a pH of nine, it will turn light pink. PH of 10 will turn dark pink. There's a couple different indicators we can use, but you always want to select the indicator that undergoes a color change closest to the pH of the equivalence point. We'll talk in a minute about what that equivalence point is. Some other two um, common base indicators used in the titrations is bromethyl blue and then methyl red, as well as phenophthalene. Let's review some important titration terms. One being the analyte. And this is the, the analyte. This is the solution of unknown concentration, but known volume. The titrant is the solution of known concentration. So your, your analyte plus your titrant gives you your products. Your equivalence point. The equivalence point in the titration is the measured quantity of titrant recorded at the point at which chemically equivalent amounts have reacted. In other words, the, the addition, you continue adding more of, or your acid base titration rate involves the reaction between the acid and base. So you have a measured volume of your standardized titrant, and you add that to a known volume of your sample, and you continue, you continue adding more until the amount of reactant in the sample is just consumed by the reactant in the titrant. So you just have consumed all of your reactants. So at that point, is the equivalence point, also called the stoichiometric point. You also have your endpoint, and the endpoint in a titration 
is the point at which a sharp change in a measurable and characteristic property occurs. In this case, it is the color change in our acid base indicator. And that indicator is your phenol phthalein, bromethyl blue, or methyl red. It's that substance that changes color when an excess of titrate has been added. And the format of the pH versus the volume added during a titration forms what we have, what, what we call a titration curve. So in this example, when the pH of the solution in the receiving flask is plotted against the volume of NaOH, that 0.1 um, NaOH solution, the result is this titration curve. The curve for the titration of the 0.1 moles per liter of HCl is typical for that, it's typical of that for the titration of any strong acid with any strong base, right? So this curve depicts the titration of the strong acid with the strong base. The curve sweeps up and to the right as NaOH is added, beginning at a pH below seven and ending at a pH above seven. So that equivalence point in this case is reached at seven. And our indicator, for example, if we use phenolphthalein, it will change color between a pH of 8 and 10. But if we choose methyl red, we'll get that color change at a, a pH of, you know, 5 to 6. And here, there's the four different types of typical titration curves. The first, the top left being a typical titration curve when you have a strong acid and a strong base. And then the top right, a strong acid and a weak base. The bottom left is the titration curve of a weak acid and a weak base. And then the bottom right is a weak acid um, with a strong base. Here's a summary of your the titration characteristics. So the type of titration, a strong acid and a weak base will have a pH um, at an equivalence point less than seven. A strong base and a strong acid will be approximately at an equivalence point of seven. And then a strong base and a weak acid, it will be greater than seven. And taking a look at our titration curve and the characteristics of the titration with a strong acid and a strong base. For example, HCl plus NaOH yields NaCl plus H2O. This curve is typical of a titration with a strong acid and a strong base. So the curve sweeps up and to the right as you add more of your NaOH. And the equivalence point is reached at approximately a pH of seven. Strong acids and bases dissociate completely. And that is our typical curve and characteristics. Contrast, let's look at a weak acid with a strong base. So, for example, NH3 plus HCl yields H2O plus NH4Cl. The NH4Cl dissociates into NH3 and NH3O plus. So, NH4 plus acts as your weak acid, creating an acidic solution at the equivalence point, so lower than seven. Your equivalence point uh, pH is lower than seven, as you can see on the graph. So what they're doing here is they're adding NH3, which is the base, into H at HCl, HCl, which is the acid. So it's just like drop by drop from the burette, it goes into the flask. 
and it becomes H2O plus NH4Cl. Um, and that that further dissociates into um, NH4. Uh, you add water to it, it becomes H2O. Um, and then NH, it further dissociates into NH3 and H30, H3O. And here we have an acid base indicator table. So different indicators have different acid strengths. The acidity or pH of the solution at which the indicator changes color will vary. So these pH values have been measured and are recorded in this table right here. So you can see the common name of the indicator and the approximate pH range that it changes. And note that in an acid-based titration, you get that pH change sharply near that equivalence point. So in selecting an indicator for a particular acid-based titration, the pH at the equivalence point must be known. So you want to see the color change at that um, at the correct point so you know you've reached the end of your titration. And that's, that looks like that's, the, that's all for this lesson. Have a great day and I'll see you next time. And here we have an acid-based indicator. Okay. And we also have an activity at the end of this. And it is another quiz, a multiple choice quiz. Okay, so be sure to work on that. All right, guys, um, are you all willing to stay uh, at until 730? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't think I can do that. Okay. Ahmed, how about you? Okay. So let's move on to lesson eight now, okay? Ahmed, are you there? Hello everyone and welcome to unit one, lesson eight. This lesson is on buffers, so let's get started. All pH groups involving or titration groups involving a weak acid or a weak base have at least one region where a buffering action occurs. And a buffering region is where the pH changes very little despite the addition of a considerable amount of acid or base. So it's a region where you're adding more acid or more base at a quite high level, but the pH is changing very little. So it's like buffering. And the curves in these relatively constant pH region, regions are almost nearly horizontal, so that middle region of those titration uh, pH curves. Um, at a volume of titrant that is basically one half the volume at the equivalence point. So you're adding more and more to the acid or base, but the pH is not um, changing. And the solution near these points has a special significance, which is called that buffer solution, or simply just a buffer. So it's a mixture of conjugate acid base pair that maintains the nearly constant pH when diluted or when strong acid or base is added. And it's an equal mixture 
of a weak acid and its conjugate base. So they resist change in pH when a moderate amount of acid or base is added. A weak acid and a salt of its conjugate base will be a buffer, or you can have this weak base and then a salt of its conjugate acid together. So some examples of the pairs which make up buffer solutions are shown here in the table. You can have acetic acid with sodium acetate, phosphoric acid with potassium phosphate, oxalic acid with lithium oxalate, and carbonic acid with sodium carbonate. And we'll go through an example. So we can look at this example, the titration of acetic acid with sodium hydroxide. The pH is approximately 4.7 at a volume of 12.5 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. Since one half of the equivalence volume has been added, one half of the original acetic acid has reacted. Right, so when a volume of titrant that is close to one half the volume at the equivalence point, is added in the titration when you have a weak acid and a strong base. The pH of the sample solution changes very little despite the addition of more base here. And this solution is called a buffer. So that highlighted plateau near the halfway mark to the equivalence point shows the buffering region of the titration. So buffering action can be explained using Bronson-Lowry equations. So when a small amount of sodium acetate is added to the acetic acid acetate ion buffer, the following reaction occurs. So the small amount of OH minus ions added would convert a small amount of acetic acid to acetate ions. So the overall effect is a small decrease in the ratio of acetic acid acid to acetate ions in the buffer and a slight increase in the pH. So this small change in the consumption of some of that added hydroxide ions in the process explains why the pH is small. And this buffer would work equally well if a small amount of a strong acid were added instead. So the hydrogen ions are consumed and the mixture now has a slightly higher ratio of acetic acid to acetate ions and a slightly lower pH than it would have had if there was no buffer present. So there is a limit to the amount of strong acid or base that a buffer can neutralize before its pH begins to rise rapidly. So they have capacity. A buffer's capacity is determined by the concentrations of its conjugate acid-base pair. And the amount of acid or base that can be added before considerable change occurs in the pH is or can be calculated, and that's considered to be the, the capacity of that buffer. So we can go through some sample problems. So for example, calculate the change in pH that occurs when 0.1 moles of HCl is added to one liter of an ammonium, ammonia ammonium chloride buffer containing 0.3 moles per liter ammonia and 0.33 moles per liter um, ammonia or the NH4 plus at equilibrium and assume no change in the volume of the buffer. So we write out our known, our knowns, 0.1 moles of HCl is added. We have our concentration of NH3 to be 0.33 and our concentration of NH4 plus to be 0.33. We write out our equilibrium equation, NH3 plus plus H2O yields NH4 plus plus OH minus. We write out our Kb, our constant expression, 
which is the concentration of each of those products over the concentration of that strong um, base, the NH3. And we find our Ka from Appendix 9 or from your table. The Ka of NH4 plus is 5.6 times 10 to the power of negative 10. We can write out our relationship between Ka and Kb is equal to Kw. So to solve for Kb, we rearrange that relationship to Kw over Ka. We know our Kw is always 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14. And we just found our Ka from the appendix or from our table, or it's given. We find our Kb to be 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. Now to get our concentration of wave minus, that is Kb times the the concentration of NH3 over the concentration of NH4 plus, those cancel each other out. And we get the concentration of OH to also be 1.8 times 10 to the negative five. And then we can use our, our POH logarithmic um, formula to determine the POH. When you subtract that from 14, you get our pH to be 9.26. However, we're not quite done there yet since HCl is a strong acid. It ionizes completely to H plus and Cl minus. Therefore, the concentration of H plus added is our moles, 0 0.10 moles over one liter, one liter. So that's 0.1 moles per liter. And then the added H plus is neutralized in a one-to-one -one reaction as shown by that following equation there. And it's one-to-one. -one. So our concentration of NH3, our final concentration is 0 0.23 moles per liter. And our final concentration of NH4 plus is 0 0.43 moles per liter. We can write out our Kb again for, um, for that, which is for this reaction, which is your NH4 plus times your concentration of OH minus over your concentration of NH3. Rearrange that for the concentration of OH and solve that. Our POH, therefore we use our log equation again, and we get our POH of 5.02. Subtract that from 14, and we get our pH to be 8.98. So the pH of the ammonia ammonium chloride buffer decreased from 9.26, right, our initial pH, and then our buffer pH to 8.98. Moving on to buffers in action. So the ability of buffers to maintain a relatively constant pH is important in many biological processes um, because certain chemical reactions need a specific pH. So many aspects of our cell functioning and metabolism are very sensitive to pH changes. So we use buffers to keep, um, to, to keep a small pH range in our bodies. So for example, enzyme, each enzyme carries out its function optimally over a small pH range. And one really important um, buffer within living cells is the conjugate acid base pair of H2PO4 minus and HPO4 two minus. Another one is the conjugate acid base pair of H2CO3 and HCO3. And our blood plasma also um, has a remarkable buffering capacity. So our, so our blood um, and different parts of our body maintain the same or small pH range. Always buffers to stay at that pH range for optimal functioning in our bodies. Human blood plasma normally has a pH of about 7.4 and any change in pH of more than 0.2 um, for example, induced by poisoning or disease is life-threatening. So if the blood were not buffered, the acid that we would absorb from simply drinking a glass of orange juice would probably be fatal. And here again is just reiterating um, what I had just said the buffering action of NaCl solution and of your blood plasma. 
So neutral saline has an initial pH mixture of 7.4, but the final pH after adding one milliliters of some acid, it goes all the way down to two. In contrast, our blood plasma, initial pH of 7.4, and when you still add a bunch of acid, it stays by 7.2, and that's because of the buffers. some more buffer systems um, in our bodies. So buffer systems so can be in our intracellular fluid or in our extracellular fluid. In our intracellular fluid, we have a phosphate buffer system and a protein buffer system. The phosphate buffer system has an important role in buffering the pH of like our urine, for example. Protein buffer systems contribute to the regulation of pH in our intracellular and extracellular fluid. So for example, our hemoglobin buffer, amino acid buffer, and then a plasma protein buffers. And then in our extracellular fluid, we have a carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system, which is the most important one for our extracellular um, fluid. The buffers in our blood, we talked a little bit about. The pH of blood is 7.35 to 7.45. So changes in pH um, below 6.8 and above 8 may result in death. So the major buffer system in our body fluid is the carbonic acid carbonate, um, H2CO3 and HCO3 minus buffer system. And for example, some CO2, some carbon dioxide, which we know is a waste product in cellular metabolism, is carried to our lungs for elimination, but the rest of it dissolves in our bodily fluids, which forms carbonic acid, which dissociates to produce bicarbonate and hydronium ions. So again, it's contributing to that buffer system. There's the equations um, showing that there. Buffers are also super important for many consumer, commercial, and industrial products as well. So fermentation, um, the manufacturing of antibiotics requires buffers to optimize yield and to avoid side effects. Production of cheese, yogurt, and sour cream is dependent on buffers to control pH. Right? Since an optimum pH is needed to manage the growth of bacteria or microorganisms in those products, and allow enzymes to catalyze the fermentation process efficiently. Sodium nitrate and vinegar are widely used to preserve food, and part of their function is to prevent the fermentation that takes place only at certain pH levels. All right, this, these next couple slides is the same example that we went through previously. So if you wanna review of that, you can go through these next slides. Um, it's just the same example, but the, the solutions are a little bit bigger to see. Again, here's part two and three of that same example. And here's the final half of the solution for the um, that same question we went through in the beginning of the lesson, the pH of the ammonia ammonium chloride buffer. And that is the end of this lesson. Have a great day and I'll see you next time. And here's the final half of the solution for the um, that same question we went through in the beginning of the lesson, the pH.
Buffer solutions resist changes in pH. So let's think about a solution of a weak acid and its conjugate base. So here we have HA, which is our generic weak acid. And so the conjugate base would be A minus. And a buffer solution needs to have substantial amounts of both present. And that's what I'm trying to represent over here. So we have a beaker right, that has, in this case, equal amounts of HA and A minus. And to our buffer solution, we're going to add some strong acid, so a source of protons. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to draw a proton in here, so H plus. I could have written H3O plus because H plus and H2O give you H3O plus. I'm just writing H plus to make it a little bit easier to think about. So if you're increasing the concentration of H plus ions or you're increasing the concentration of hydronium ions, in solution, you would think that would decrease the pH dramatically. And that would happen if you didn't have something to react with the protons in solution. But we do in our buffer solution, right? We have A minus, we have our base. The base is going to pick up this proton and H plus and A minus are going to form HA. So we're going to make more of our weak acid here. So let's see, we started out with some weak acids. Let me go ahead and draw that in here. So some HA. And then we're going to make more because H plus and A minus give us HA. So we're making more of our weak acid here. What about A minus? All right, well, we're going to use one of these up to, to make HA, right? So now we have only two of these left. So we're decreasing the concentration of A minus. But what we've done is we've effectively removed protons from the solution. And that's how, that's how a buffer is able to resist a change in pH if you add acid. What about if you add base? So next, let's think about our buffer solution. And this time we're going to add a strong base. So we're going to increase the concentration of hydroxide ions in solution. So if we increase the concentration of hydroxide ions in solution, you would think that would increase the pH, right? And it would, except for the fact that we have an acid that can react with our base, right? So we have some weak acid present here and the hydroxide ion is going to pick up a proton from HA, right? So we have H plus here. So OH minus and H plus give us H2O. So we're going to make, we're going to make water here, right? So we're going to lose some of our weak acid. So we started with three and now we have only two left here. And if OH minus, if hydroxide takes a proton away from HA, then we're left with A minus. So we're going to increase the amount of A minus that we have, right, in solution. So let me go ahead and draw that in here. So once again, we've, we've effectively buffered against a change in pH because the hydroxide ions that we added right, were reacted with the acid that was present. So we've effectively removed hydroxide ions from solution. All right, so that's the idea of a buffer solution. Let's see if we can derive an equation that will allow us to do some calculations. And so next, let's look at what we have down here, right? So we know that we have in the buffer, we have, uh, we have substantial amounts of HA and A minus present. And so we have this reaction at equilibrium. So for our equilibrium expression, right, concentration of products over concentration of reactants. So here we have our concentration of products over our concentration of reactants, once again, leaving water out. Let's take the negative log of both sides of this. So we're going to take the negative log of Ka. So that would be negative log of Ka here. And the negative log of all of this, which would be equal to the negative log of all of that. And I'm going to write it a little bit differently. I'm going to put the concentration of hydronium ions out front here and then have concentration of A minus over concentration of HA. All right, I wrote it like this because it makes it a little bit easier to see a property of a logarithm. Let me just go ahead and write down the property that I'm referring to. If you have log of A times B, that's the same thing as log of A plus log of B. And here we have the negative log. So the negative log of a b is equal to the negative log of a plus the negative log of b. So I'm just going to write minus the log of b here. And in this case, right, concentration of H3O plus, that would be a, right? So this would be a, and then this over here would be b. 
right? So let's think about what that would give us now. So let's get some more space and let's think about our log property. So on the left side, we have negative log of Ka. On the right side, we would have negative log of A. So that would be negative log of concentration of H3O plus, right, minus, minus the log of B here. So that would be minus the log, and B was this right here, minus the log of A minus over HA. All right, so we can keep going here because we know the negative log of KA, right? The negative log of KA is equal to the PKA. So this is equal to the PKA. And then over here, we have the negative log of the concentration of hydronium ions. That's equal to the pH, right? So negative log of concentration of H3O plus is equal to the pH. And then we have minus log of the concentration of A minus over the concentration of HA. And so we can rewrite this in, uh, for our final equation. So we're just gonna rewrite this solve for pH. pH is equal to pKa plus the log of A minus over, over the concentration of, uh, of HA here. And this is called the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So right here is the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. It's very useful when you're doing buffer calculations. All right, we'll look at an examples of this in the next video. All right, guys, so this was a really good resource going over the buffer equations. And there is an activity associated with this as well. So go ahead and work on this multiple choice quiz. Um, and so yeah, this is kind of, we're kind of reaching towards the end of unit one, which is good. Um, so we're gonna, so unit, so you have a unit test coming up and here it is right here. So if you can go ahead and, you know, start working on this after you've done all your quizzes, um, go ahead and start your work on this as well. And refer to the older, like your older um, uh, lectures as well, the older lessons when you're doing this test. Um, so, 